Welcome everybody to a new global immunotalk. I am absolutely delighted to introduce our global immunospeaker today, Dr. Debrowski Herbert. Debrowski is currently an associate professor of immunology at the University of Pennsylvania, where he holds the Penn Presidential Associate Professorship. Now, Debrowski was born in California and then did his undergraduate studies at Xavier University of Louisiana, where he obtained a bachelor's in microbiology. He then joined Thomas Jefferson University for his PhD studies with Dr. David Abraham. And it is there where I think he started to become absolutely fascinated about the immune response to parasites. So much so that then he continued training in the area of immunoparasitology with Dr. Frank Brombacher at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. I'm sure that was a fascinating academic and life experience. During his training and then in his independent laboratory, Debrowski has made absolutely fundamental contributions to our understanding on how various immune cells from macrophages, eosinophils, and lymphocytes, how they play a key role in the immune response to parasites with a focus on helminths. And in doing so, his laboratory has revealed fundamentals of the process of wound healing. And in particular, has told us a lot about the role of reparative cytokines such as those of the trefoil factor family. Additionally, more recently, his laboratory has been actively studying a very intriguing cytokine, IL-33, and I'm sure we're going to learn more about this cytokine today. Debrowski has received numerous awards. I want to highlight some of them. He is the recipient of the prestigious Burroughs Welcome Award in the Pathogenesis of Infectious Diseases, and he was also elected as lecturer for the Vanguard Award from the American Association of Immunologists in 2021. On a more personal note, I remember Dabrowski when we met, I don't know, maybe eight, nine years yeah. ago, it was while you were at UCSF, uh, we were very interested in trying to set up uh, the Nipostrongylus brasiliensis model in the lab because we wanted to understand the role of macrophages in repair. And we wouldn't have been able to do this without your help. Not only you share the warm with us, but you really share with us all that knowledge that you have gathered over the years in these models. And we were able to successfully set it up because of you. So I'm very, very grateful for that. Uh, so I am sure we are in for a treat. Uh, with Debrowski's Global Immunotalk, which is entitled Alarming Controversies in IL-33 Biology. Debrowski, thank you so much. It is a true honor to host you today. Thank you for accepting our invitation. Thank you. So as everybody knows, we love to start with some questions for our speakers, more personal questions. And so what we would absolutely love to hear from you today is if you could share with us one of your most inspiring scientific experiences. Thank you so much, Carla, for <clears throat> inviting me and having me here. You know, you provide these questions beforehand, and you and Alina, and I thought a lot about it, and I, I'm going to have to give you two because I couldn't That's decide fine. which one was the best. <laughs> um, the, the first was, I remembered as if it was yesterday, um, the moment in which I knew exactly the direction of my laboratory and that I was gonna be a principal investigator leading that research and employing individuals and moving forward, getting federal funding to do work that I wanted to do was so it's just inspiring beyond words. Yes. And tied, tied to that has been this recent emergence of the, the recognition of the importance of, of individuals from diverse backgrounds in science. You know, since the murder of George Floyd, there's been a, a and the number of protests that followed um, on the whole world scale has really been for me incredibly inspiring because now all my colleagues, or at least most of my colleagues, certainly recognize the importance 
of, of having a diverse faculty or having diverse perspectives, because that's the way we get the most out of our science. Absolutely. Thank you, Dabrowski. Thank you for being an inspiring example. And uh, we are absolutely delighted and looking forward to learning more about your research. So let's see, you are sharing well, perfect. Okay, let's learn more about IL-33. Okay. Thank you. And say thank you so much, Carla, for, for uh, giving me the, this opportunity today. I, I like to start with this slide because it really impresses upon uh, those in the audience how important I feel the study of parasitic infections have been not only for understanding the basic mechanisms of uh, immunology, but also because collectively these organisms affect billions of people, perhaps half of the world's population in the developing world and also in the developed world. And these are mostly infections of the poor. So by research on these parasites, we can gain, uh, generate more uh, interest and focus on diseases that can be eliminated. My thesis from my laboratory that I formed uh, probably on that day uh, that I described, which was the most inspiring day for me uh, in my early scientific career, is that mammalian coevolutionary adaptation to helmet infection has driven tissue repair molecules to become immunoregulatory. And, you know, perhaps, you know, looking at these, these very uh, well-known historic images of hookworms feeding on the bowel, uh, perhaps it's easy to, to understand how I could come up with such a hypothesis. And uh, that these are the, that's what really drives our experiments and directs our questions we ask in the field, in, in our laboratory. And so two of the key questions I'm going to kind of highlight today are that what are the key cytokines that drive immunity in local tissue microenvironments where the parasites live? And more importantly, does the cellular context of that cytokine release matter? And so, yes, we're going to focus on IL-33, but before I get to that, you know, what we should, we should all know from our entry-level uh, biology classes that most cytokines or secreted proteins are, are produces which uh, from a conventional pathway that requires signal peptide. And so from uh, being coming through the ER, being uh, glycosylated and the, and the Golgi, and proteins make their way to their final um, resting places. So whether they be tethered in the plasma membrane or secreted or, or uh, find their way in lysosomes or even through exosomes, most of the cytokines that immunologists uh, uh, think about come through this pathway. However, you know, we have a little bit of a conundrum. Uh, uh, there's been over the past decade or, or more, uh, it's been a really a strong uh, appreciation that there are cytokines uh, constitutively expressed at barrier surfaces that are released upon injury. Now here I'm noting the type 2 flavor cytokines, IL-25, thymic stromal lymphopoietin, and IL-33, of which I will focus on today. I might add that, that cytokines in the IL-1 family uh, and also HMGB1 also fall within this category of being released upon injury and where they then go on to engage a variety of hematopoietic and non-hematopoietic cells to affect immune responses. And so here is the conundrum. So what about cytokines if they lack a signal peptide? Well, then how, how does that all work? And, and this has been an active uh, area of interest for many investigators across the, the global scene. And in the IL-1 family, uh, you have uh, many different flavors. Uh, you have of uh, cytokines that have been primarily relegated to type one, promoting type 1 and type 17 responses, although it's clear that IL-18 has a duality in, in its role. It's not solely on this spot of the, the equation. Uh, um, IL-1 family members also have uh, anti-inflammatory roles. These are less well studied, but certainly a rife area for discovery. And as I already alluded to today, we're going to focus on IL-33 and its unique role in, in predominantly promoting uh, type 2 response, although we do also know from, from the literature now that IL-33 also has a myriad of effects on other effector cell lineages. Now, uh, Philippe Girard was one of the first investigators to to identify IL-33 at their basal, uh, basally expressed at mucosal barrier sites. And this images show you IL-33 is primarily uh, and still uh, widely appreciated to be a nuclear resident cytokine. 
okay? And its thought, its mode of action, is that it's then it, it, it's released from a particular type of death in the cells. And I'm gonna go into this just a little bit, but traumatic injury, or you can imagine a large parasitic worm barreling through the mucosa of the intestinal tract leads to the necrosis of these cells. And this is the conventional theory is that R33 that is uh, otherwise tethered uh, into the nucleus then is able to leach out and where it can then have activity on various immune cell types. IL-33 has a pro and a mature forms, uh, several mature forms um, that can be further processed by extracellular proteases. This work here on the right shows you where investigators have looked at ILC2 expansion, which is a really a, a, a conserved role for, for IL-33. I'm sure you remember Rich Loxley's talk a few, a few weeks back. And that, however, I want to point out that while the cleave forms have enhanced uh, biological, biological activity in inducing IL-13 production from IL-C2s, the pro form also has a uh, pretty robust uh, uh, biological activity. The last point I want to make about this slide is that, you know, when looking at this, this, this paradigm, this model, something struck me as missing. And that is, how could it be? that a cell death mechanism, a necrotic cell death mechanism, could both promote inflammation by engaging through its canonical receptor on these cell types, but also suppress inflammation by interacting with T regulatory cells, the immune system's uh, um, suppressors. And so we really start, that, that, that the conundrum really puzzled me for a while. And in today's talk, I'm going to speak to this divergence and how an, uh, the same cytokine can have these two different roles. Now, a little bit more about the biology in that um, IL-33 is known to, to signal through a heterodynamic receptor uh, comprised of IL-1 receptor accessory protein and ST2, uh, leading to the activation of MITE88, and downstream of which leads to NF-kappa B activation and MAP kinase pathways, implicating IL-33 in proliferative expansion and survival and some other activities. I'm going to show you a piece of data, however, and that kind of challenges this paradigm. In fact, my goal today is to show you that dogma is not necessarily dogma. It really depends on the context. And there's an exciting number of, of, of reports that are coming out that help to redefine how we're thinking about this cytokine. And so a little bit going a little bit deeper, what, what has been long appreciated is that IL-33 and its regulation, and it really needs tight regulation for uh, investigators have shown that lack of the nuclear uh, uh, tether leads to a foamy eosinophilic lethal inflammation. So uh, the body has evolved to, uh, to sequester IL-33, to inactivate IL-33 during apoptosis by cleavage by caspases, of which uh, are thought to cleave right in the ST2 binding domain. Inactivation rapidly by, by oxidation, when this, uh, these disulfide bonds actually prevent IL-33 from binding to ST2. Um, this can happen within hours of being released from a, from a cell. And also uh, the induction of soluble ST2 receptor that would then sequester uh, IL-33's biological activity. So there's a lot of reported ways on how IL-33 biological activity can be constrained. But if you ask me, the worms always know how to do it better. And this is an outstanding report. I encourage you to, to get this paper if you have not read it uh, from uh, Rick Mazels and led by Henry McSorley, um, showing that certain worms uh, uh, that, that are mouse specific worms, uh, Heligosmoides polygyrus, have been shown to have evolved to secrete proteins that directly bind IL-33. This protein called um, uh, Heligosomoides polygyrus alarmin uh, uh, resonant uh, uh, interference protein actually uh, binds both DNA and binds to IL-33 and helps to retain that IL-33 inside necronic cells and prevent its biological activity. The authors went on to define the different domains 
uh, in the protein that are responsible for this. And one can kind of imagine that, particularly in the, the context of, of allergic uh, responses induced by alternaria, which was used in this study, that this, this protein derived from worms could be really efficacious in helping to block uh, diseases like allergic asthma. I'm sure Henry is, is, is actively looking at that right now. Indeed, I want to go to another controversy, and that is about the, this of a cleavage site, in that it has long been appreciated that apoptotic uh, uh, execution of caspases cleave IL-33 in its ST2 binding domain, rendering it inactive, right? Whereas the extracellular proteases that I've mentioned from neutrophil, neutrophil elastases, mast cell tryptase, and the like, will cleave it here to allow that biologic uh, biological activity to ensue. However, there's been recent work from Mark Rothenberg's laboratory at Cincinnati Children's that really challenges this idea. You know, I, again, I encourage you to take a look at this. This, this report makes a very interesting observation that uh, in a, uh, a caspase 8 dependent pathway downstream of the repoptosome actually leads to the release of IL-33 following exposure of epithelial cells to allergen. And this is not a cell death pathway. The, the LDH uh, uh, levels were very, very low in these experiments, suggesting that these epithelial cells remain completely intact. However, in response to environmental allergens, only a, a certain subset of the allergens that they, they, they looked at um, was able to induce IL-33 release. So there's more to the story than the necrotic uh, death release pathway. And one more idea. And this is work from Michael Holtzman's group. This is recently published in, in JCI. And now you will remember that pathway I just showed in which IL-33 binds to ST2 to affect its biological activity. Well, in this context, the authors used a, a model of post-viral lung disease. And that this is the, uh, a severe condition that can occur downstream of viral infections like influenza, in this study, this was Sendai virus, and yes, also SARS-CoV-2 can induce pathology like this. So get your vaccine and wear your mask. Moving on, however, um, this post-viral lung disease phenotype was entirely dependent upon these basal, cycling basal cells that uh, use IL-33 in an, a cell intrinsic manner that was not dependent upon these cells lysing and releasing IL-33 and working through the, the ST2, the heterodynamic receptor that, that I mentioned. So in some instances, IL-33 in the nucleus can have an effect on transcription. And in fact, the, the investigators think this has a lot to do with STAT3 phosphorylation and enhancer binding. So I really you know, encourage you to take a look at this as well. So do we really know much about IL-33 if, if that was the dog and all these exciting reports are coming out? Well, on to my story and, and to our particular contribution to the field of IL-33. Well, as Carla pointed out, we've been using the Nipostrondos Brasiliensis model for quite some time, which is an excellent system that mimics some features of parasitic helminth health infection. Now, in the early stages when the larvae uh, pass through the skin and migrate through the vasculature into the lung parenchyma, the larvae cause a petechial hemorrhagic injury. The parasites are then coughed up and swallowed to enter the GI tract, and most investigators have been studying type 2 immunity in this gut phase. This has historically been the model to understand mucosal type 2 immunity in the GI tract. However, when our foray into this matter, we, we focused on the lung phase. And indeed, we, we found uh, clear evidence that IL-33 was driving a, a non-canonical type 2 immunity, one that, that did not have an impact on IL-4, but rather affect IL-13 production from lung IL-C2s. As you can see here, from the lung, uh, lung digest, IL-33 knockouts fail to undergo that very rapid expansion of lung IL-C2s that produce IL-13 that can be observed as early as three days post-infection. Now, that injury 
is quite profound. And here are some images uh, taken from a, another study led by one of my senior investigators in my group, Lee and Hung, in which you can see as early as 24 hours post uh, infection, the worms are induces the, inducing these focal areas of injury that peak around day three, which is when the ALC2s expand. And now the, the, one of the first studies that we found after uh, I became an independent investigator was that there's a different molecule that acts upstream of IL-33, and that is the truffle factor. Uh, this is a, a wide uh, a family of three uh, molecules that, that are, are very, very small and produced at sites of barrier injury to help facilitate the restitution process. And what we were able to demonstrate was that uh, truffle factor two uh, following worm infection, following Nipostrongulus infection, demarcated those areas of focal injury. And so they were, it was really a molecule that was one of the earliest signs that tissue injury in the lung had occurred. It had profound effects on, on, on macrophages and helping to shape their function. And not only, not only that, but triple factor three controlled IL-33. And so I, I want to make, make a point here and, and a, a broader point. So now through this study that was in collaboration with Marsha Wilskarp, who was my chair at the time, uh, we found that triple factor two deficiency impaired IL-33 expression from epithelial cells as well as the myeloid compartment. But now, of course, you would uh, immediately be able to observe that the level of IL-33 expression in epithelial cells was far outpaced that was the orders of magnitude higher than that in the myeloid compartment. And so the, this was, was something that, of course, to, to the, the average person would look at this and say, well, is this real? You know, is, is this really a biologically important? Because clearly this population makes a lot more IL-33. And, and I, I, I uh, contend that just because it's a small population doesn't mean it can have a small impact. And I'll leave it at that. We went on to, to, to focus on this myeloid-derived IL-33 and recently demonstrated that both in the humans with chronic rhinal sinusitis, as well as mice under basal conditions, have myeloid cells that express IL-33. So here's the data. So this, what you're looking at is an, um, a polyp, a nasal polyp excised by my colleague, Noam Cohen here at, in the Perlman School. And as you can see, immunostaining clearly demonstrates IL-33 in the nuclei of these epithelial cells that cover the dome of the polyp. However, in the lamina propria region, so there's a kind of a, a, a basal lamina over here, but in the lamina propria region where, a region where the inflammatory cells are, you have clear evidence that there's class two expressing cells that co-express IL-33. And not all of these were, were mononuclear. Some of these actually look like eosinophils. In addition to that, uh, we were able to demonstrate in mice under basal conditions, again, you see that IL-33, as expected, is in the nuclei of these epithelial cells boarding the villus. This is a central villus of a, a mouse under steady state conditions. However, we do see there's these rare, albeit clear evidence that uh, myeloid cells can express 33. Now, what we're following up right in today's experiments are uh, what's the significance of 33 being in the cytoplasm versus the nucleus and the myeloid cells. So to, to dig deeper into this issue, we, we obtained um, fluorescent reporter mice from Paul Bryce, who's now at Sanofi, used to be at Northwestern, to really fate map and conditionally delete IL-33 in key cell lineages. To ask the question, even though the myeloid population was a small, relatively small population of cells that expressed 33, could it be biologically important? And so uh, our initial studies show that indeed on C11C expressing cells that have IL-33 in their basal conditions in many different uh, organs. And we use a, a quite a complex gating strategy to identify multiple dendritic cell populations and macrophage populations, all of which led to the data as you see here in that while IL-33 was clearly not in lymphoid derived APCs or PDCs, we could find evidence that IL-33 expression, at least at the transcript level, was evident in many different dendritic cell populations. 
So that was kind of cool, right? And that we, we could confirm our immunofluorescence studies and see that on a broad scale, R33 was in multiple DC populations. And we asked them about its biological importance first in vitro. And these studies were led by a very talented individual, Bernal Singh, who's now at Genentech doing his postdoctoral work. Bernal uh, undertook this strategy where he asked whether dendritic cells that either possessed IL-33 or lacked IL-33 had any impact on T cell differentiation particularly T helper cell differentiation. And he evaluated both by transcription factor staining and cytokines. Bernal did really an amazing job with this work. The main conclusion, the take home message of all these experiments was that of all the different T helper subsets, it was the Treg population that IL-33 made a difference in as much as Dendritic cells lacking IL-33 did not promote the expansion of Tregs as much as those that were replete with IL-33. In fact, this agreed quite nicely with work from, from uh, Fiona Powery and Yasmin Belke. Yasmin also has a, a, a version of this work that she also published showing that there's a Treg subset that particularly responds to IL-33. That response to IL-33 both promotes uh, the uh, uh, restricts immunopathology. I'm pointing to here that when the authors, when Fiona transferred in Tregs that lack responsiveness to IL-33 by uh, uh, the ST2 deletion, they were no longer able to suppress colliders as well as those that were able to receive IL-33 signals. And not only were they more suppressive, but they also proliferatively expanded more. And so, you know, this idea, I think, um, you know, Dan Campbell is most, most notable for this, that Tregs have different flavors for different type of effector responses was something that we really wanted to follow up with in our model. And as much as IL-33 was concerned, because it's been clearly shown that IL-33 has a very important role for this particular subset of the SD2 expressing, GATA3 expressing Treg subset. Indeed, and in collaboration with Yasmin Belkay's group at the NIH, we were able to generate a clear evidence that mice lacking this particular subset of the GATA3 expressing FOX33 Tregs um, had an accelerated clearance phenotype. So it did, in fact, agree with the idea that enhanced type 2 responses were blocked by a particular subset of Tregs. So how does that come back to IL-33? Well, we started thinking with this data, well, what if, just what if, the dendritic cells providing IL-33 uh, uh, serves as a, a role as an important signal three, because as you will all know as immunologists, um, that um, DCs provide both uh, peptide MHC, co-stem, as well as cytokine to direct T-cell differentiation, identity, survival, and the like, right? So could DCs giving IL-33 serve that important role? In fact, we, we, we made mice that particularly lack IL-33 in the dendritic cell compartment, as well as some tissue macrophages. And as you can see here, the DCs have the different forms of IL-33, both the proforms as well as the cleave forms. So we wanted, to, of course, to ask, was this biologically important? And indeed, the data were striking. And that if IL-33 was lost in the intestinal epithelial cell compartment, in our nipostrongulus model, as expected, animals were increased, had increased susceptibility. I'm showing you eggs per gram and feces and the number of worms uh, in, in the intestinal lumen. Conversely, the lack of myeloid-derived 33 had the exact opposite response and quite a robust response that was events earlier on during the infection, about day four, not just at day six, but clearly these animals cleared their, their worms very quickly and in essence phenocopied the GATA3 deficient Treg phenotype. Indeed, we were able to show that by transferring in Tregs by a different, couple of different methods, we were able to uh, rescue these animals. And so this idea that location matters and cell source matters really started to catch hold in that we, we found further evidence that in the gut, where um, we know that there's a resonant Tregs in, in the intestine, it seemed as which, and we're following up on this now, 
that R33 derived from hematopoietic cells could be in a closer vicinity uh, to, to T-Rex and maybe augment their numbers under basal conditions or following infection. Whereas the epithelial derived IL-33 could be serving a different role, perhaps through lysis and expanding ILCs in, in this compartment or other cell types. You know, this idea that, that DCs and T cells must be in this dynamic dance with one another is, is really rife in the field. This, this is from a review from Philippe Boussol that, that shows that DC T cell interactions are, are quite dynamic, particularly in, in lymph nodes. They can be transient, they can be stable, they swarm. And so we, we thought that there was a lot of, of kind of uh, evidence around this idea that DC is providing R33 to a particular T cell in a particular type of tissue niche could be incredibly important. So we start to then ask, well, what is so special about this IL-33 expressing CEC? And in fact, the, the, the observation that 33 within the dendritic cell was more in a cytoplasm rather than the nucleus stimulated a hypothesis in the lab that perhaps DCs had a particular delivery mechanism to get that 33 from inside the cell out to speak to T cells. You know, and so, so also these are images from Mark Dustin's work showing you that, you know, this, in, this intimate interaction between dendritic cells shown here in green and T cells can be quite a long lived and be quite dynamic. And so we sought to sequence dendritic cells that either uh, possessed IL-33 or that lacked IL-33 with a uh, inclusion criteria for when the data came out was that we were particularly looking for genes that could maybe facilitate this transfer when the, the two cells came together. The outcome was better than I could have imagined. Because again, even though this gene here did not have the, the extent of downregulation as some of these other targets, again, this idea that just because you're a small guy doesn't mean you can't have a big infect. Just this low level expression on this gene called macrophage protein express gene one really caught our eye. And you can see here some of the, um, the pathways that were also underrepresented in these IL-33 deficient dendritic cells. So we start to really dig into this, this gene and its function because MPEG-1 actually is, encodes a protein called perforin-2. Now, perforin-2, you may not have, have recognized previously, is closely related to perforin-1, which is again closely related to C9. These pore-forming uh, proteins are, are not very homologous to the gastrodermans. However, um, they do all have this conserved macrophage attack complex pore-forming domain, which makes what makes perforin-2 so unique is that perforin-2 has this transmembrane tether. And the existing data, uh, um, mostly generated, generated by Eckhard Podak and others, indicates that perforin-2 is a very important effector molecule in tissue macrophages that rapidly relocates and fuses with the endosome, the phagosome, for that phagolysosomal fusion, if you will, after phagocytosis of microbes. And many investigators have been able to show that perforin-2 deficiency, both in mice and in humans, um, impairs microbial effector killing. Now, of course, our hypothesis was that perforin-2, if it were going to be a delivery conduit for IL-33, but at some point in this cycle, need to be on the plasma membrane. Indeed, Eckhart and others had demonstrated that not only is, is perforin-2 in endosomes and ER and Golgi, but at some point it's also at the plasma membrane. So we were emboldened by this and we sought to investigate further. And in working with, with Brianne Brown at, at Vanderbilt, we also had this evidence that it, it seemed as though, um, at least structurally, the, per, the pore created by the perforin-2 molecule could easily fit IL-33. This is a rendering through PyMol of showing you the human IL-33, uh, which is only about 50 to 60% similar to mouse IL-33, but still, um, and that this, at least structurally, could be a delivery conduit. So this was a kind of a, a provocative data that further stimulated, stimulated us to investigate further. 
And I, I do want to give a nod to Jonathan Kagan and others that also, you know, help to, to build our ideas around why a poor could be so important for delivering cytokine. So Kagan and colleagues and many others that uh, there's too many to, to, to mention uh, right now, um, I've, I've, I've kind of solidified this paradigm, whereas I1 beta, once it's cleaved by uh, caspase 1, can also facilitate its delivery through uh, maturation of gastrin D, which then deposits in the cell membrane and allows the matured I1 beta also process by, process by caspase 1 to uh, uh, leave the cell. And in, in the early stages, this is while, while macrophages and dendritic cells are still alive. And, and, and work has been shown that this pathway can help to serve as somewhat of an adjuvant for type 1 and type 17 responses. So if you put this together, you know, our sequencing data that's, ah, L33, it's endogenously promoting this poor forming protein. And also the paradigm that other members of the IL-1 family also used the cell membrane pores to facilitate export really got our juices flowing. And so we started to, to, to look at uh, perfrin 2 and where it was be localized in uh, dendritic cells. What I'm showing you here are images from, uh, again, nasal polyps. So these are human uh, antigen-presenting cells. And you can see here what the arrow pointing to, perfrin 2 had this configuration where it emanated from the inside of the cell and seemed to have its busy end pointed out into the extracellular space. And, and as I, I mentioned earlier, um, Eckhart and others had demonstrated that perfrin 2 could be uh, part of endosomes. And so you can see here by this, this Z-stack image that not only uh, are there evidence of perfrin 2 containing endosomes inside the cell, but at some point, the genesis of the, the seemed to be at the, the plasma membrane. And this is an active area of research for us right now. And we're, we're following up these, these observations with more mechanistic studies. Okay. Um, furthermore, uh, using a transcriptional approach with a single cell RNA sequencing, we start sought to understand the breadth of, of perfrin 2 expression by virtue of looking at MPEG transcripts. And you can see here, again, in patients with nasal polyp disease, whereas many uh, cells within the nasal polyp express class 2 or HLA-DR, the MPEG or perfrin 2 expressing population was really in the macrophage and here are the dendritic cells. And mostly these are CDC2 populations that express high levels of perfrin 2, uh, uh, right. So kind of putting, teasing this idea that dendritic cells expressing perfrin 2 could be part of the cytokine delivery mechanism. Now, to really put the two together, on the one side, this potential delivery conduit, and the other side, the, the T cell that needs to receive the signal, we conducted several amnest image stream experiments. In these experiments, what we were differentiating Treg cells over four days with dendritic cells and naive T cells, T helper cells. And what I'm showing you are images where we were absolutely uh, fascinated by capturing where the conjugates were still together. And that here's a dendritic cell uh, conjugated to two T helper cells. You can see here the DC has class two, the T cells don't. And right at that interface was perfrin 2. Again, is making it really tempting to speculate that perfrin 2 may be helping to, to facilitate this communication between these two cell types. But what was really remarkable was that, you know, remember that Michael Holtzman paper I mentioned earlier about the kind of in, intrinsic IL-33 expression uh, uh, activity? Also, there's the ST2 pathway. Well, 33 deficient dendritic cells no longer uh, uh, moved perfrin 2 to that interface uh, with the T cell. So we're, we're really uh, eager to, to explore both the, the cell autonomous and also a, 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 a paracrine uh, signaling mechanism that out, whereby in IL-33 controls perfrin 2 expression. So that's an active area of research for us today. Now, coming back to the idea that this potential, uh, this pore forming protein could be a 
potential delivery conduit, we did two following experiments and where we compared dendritic cells, both uh, GMCSF as well as flit ligand induced DCs and flit ligand GMSF induced DCs pioneered by, by, um, by Kim Murphy and others. Uh, and we compared ALT33 levels that were secreted versus in the cell lysates. And in, in both instances where we use small interfering RNA as well as CRISPR mutants, you can clearly see that the release of 33 in the supernatant was perfin 2 dependent, whereas lysis uh, was, uh, ALT33 release upon lysis was perfin 2 independent, consistent with our hypothesis. And so, so lastly, we, we wanted to ask whether if we blocked uh, perfin 2 during the development of Tregs, would this have any biological effect? In these experiments, we've used uh, perfin 2 blocking antibody. We've also done perfin 2 knockout experiments. I'm just not going to show you that data. And we asked well, what was the, the, the nature of the Tregs at the end of the procedure and whether they expressed AC2 or not being that particular Treg subset. And indeed, if you gate on the SC2 expressing Tregs, you see that the blockade of perfin 2, it does not block the commitment of Tregs, but it does block their proliferative expansion, which really gives a nod again to that MAP kinase pathway that, that was, I mentioned earlier, that I'll throw, uh, downstream of IL-33. Um, perfin 2 blockade was more efficacious than IL-33 deficiency. Um, we now know wh why that is. I just don't have time to go into it. But the quantification of the S phase T regs closes a, seer, a clear impact of, of lacking perfin 2 on T reg uh, proliferative outgrowth. And the last piece of data I'm going to show you today is that we've now gone on to study the whole body knockout. We're now starting to do work on conditional knockouts for perfin 2. As, and as one would predict, the lack of, of perfin 2 leads to an accelerated ex expulsion phenotype in the Nipostrongos model. I just want to remind you of those, those uh, the, the, the phenotypes in the myeloid 33 deficient mouse infected with Nipostrongulus had this phenotype, as well as the Treg specific GATA3 mutant that also had the similar phenotype. So these are all kind of phenocopy one another and kind of help to build this, this view that maybe there's this, this conduit protein is serving a very biologically important role in as much as myeloid 33 is concerned. And so some key points I want to leave you with today. Dendritic cells can serve as an important source of the alarming cytokine, IL-33. Dendritic cells can potentially deliver IL-33 through the poor forming protein perforin-2. Uh, we didn't do, uh, we, there's certainly a lot more to do here to demonstrate IL-33 coming through the conduit uh, generated by perforin-2. And we're investigating uh, how does perforin-2, the poor forming activity, affect the viability of the dendritic cell. There, there are certainly some calcium-dependent membrane uh, repair pathways that, that we're investigating. And lastly, dendritic cell derived 33 favors ST2 Treg proliferative expansion. Of course, we're going back in vivo to investigate this further. But these are really the, the key points I want to leave you with. So in conclusion, I want to leave you with, with a few models. You know, here at, at Penn, particularly in our department, we do not let our trainees out without having a highly effective model. And I hope I have achieved that, that, that mark here today for you. The previous model or the existing paradigm is that IL-33 is this nuclear tethered cytokine that's present in epithelial cells, endothelial cells. And if you look um, at um, Diane Mathis' work and, and, and Christoph's work, you'll see that there's a variety of different uh, fibroblast populations that express 33 and that those fibroblasts are closely opposed to neurons and they seem to help Tregs as well. Um, but the existing paradigm is just that, that IL-33 is in the nuclei of primarily of these cells and somehow following injury, this IL-33 is released. It has to be a necrotic injury, of course. And that elaboration into the extracellular space is then able to activate and engage a variety of, of re tissue resident cells, most notably of which uh, ILC2s, which have high levels of ST2 on their surface. And this uh, facilitates their proliferative expansion and, and 
mostly the production of type 2 cytokine, right? So that's, this is kind of the paradigm that we appreciate today. Based on our data and, and a few other emerging reports, I'd like to propose that we revise this idea that IL-33 is solely a, a product of stromal or structural cell types, but also can be a product of hematopoietic cells, most notably of which myeloid-derived antigen-presenting cells. And, and in this mechanism, IL-33 is not just in the nucleus, although there's some DCs that express it in the nucleus, but mostly this IL-33 is in the cytoplasm. And this small amounts of IL-33 in the cytoplasm of APCs could have a very profound impact on certain T-cell populations. The data I've shown you today suggests that this IL-33 is important for ST2-positive, GATA3-positive T-Rex. Now, further, this, this, this delivery could be facilitated by uh, an, uh, either an autocrine mechanism or a cell intrinsic mechanism or paracrine mechanism. Uh, we're still looking at these different options, but that upregulates the poor forming protein perforin 2. And it is this IL-33 dependent of regulation of perforin 2 that is important for the delivery, a precise delivery, of small amounts of IL-33 right at the right spot. Think about desert farming. You can look that up on YouTube. Um, and, and this delivery through ST2, uh, through perforin 2 uh, facilitates the activity uh, on Tregs and other ST2 bearing cells potentially. And so if we put it all together in a unified model, uh, thank goodness for BioRender, um, one could imagine that IL-33 can operate, have a duality in its role by both uh, promoting inflammatory responses, as been well documented by in the literature, but also this can potentially explain how IL-33 from a different cell source can promote anti-inflammatory immunosuppressive mechanisms through the, uh, the delivery to Tregs and the suppression of effector populations. I'd like to, to end the talk by really um, thanking a, an amazing uh, group of scientists that, that I work with and, and colleagues. So uh, I'm highlighting Lien, uh, who's been with me since our early days in, in UCSF in the bowels of the San Francisco General Hospital. <laughs> And um, Leanne has been working on this project for quite some time, and she is certainly a force to be reckoned with, and everybody loves her. Uh, Bonnie Douglas, who's fin just recently defended her thesis, is on to greener passers. Uh, Annabelle did all the, the, the sequencing and, and analysis for this. So she's early stages in her graduate school career here at Penn. Um, Carl Herbine was my tech at the time, did a lot of immunofluorescence studies. Carl is, is in grad school at Thomas Jefferson, kind of following my footsteps. And um, Nicole Maloney, my uh, uh, GI fellow in the lab. Chris Pastor has also been with us for a couple of years. He did a lot of the work with the intestinal epithelial cell derived 33 and is continuing to work on this model. It's very exciting. And many of the others, students and trainees over the years have had their hands on this project. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, recognize my close uh, colleague and friend, Noam Cohen, for which we were able to do the collaborative work on uh, chronic rhinosinusitis in, in humans, and uh, Taku Kambayashi's lab, uh, where Renal who's in, in this lab, like I said, he's at, at, at Genentech now, and we collaborate broadly with other members across campus, and Barron's, Chris Hunter, and also uh, also Dan you know, Reed at the Monell Institute. And we're handsomely supported by the NIH. And, and as Carla uh, mentioned earlier, the borough's welcome. And I wanna thank you for your time and attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dabrowski, for such an interesting and clear uh, talk. That was fascinating. Very interesting to start understanding the diverse roles of IL-33 derived from the stroma versus these immune cells and probably how together they give rise to the most adaptive response to the helminth infection. Yeah, I, I think a whole meeting uh, could be run on IL-33, if anybody out there is interesting.
Thank you so much. Before we leave, I want to remind everybody on how you can ask questions to Dabrowski on today's talk. You can go to the uh, Global Immuno Talk Twitter account where you will be able to find a tweet that says ask questions for Dr. Dabrowski Herbert here. And remember, uh, you can reply to that tweet with your question and do not forget to mention the hashtag Global Immuno and uh, Dabrowski's uh, Twitter account, which he will use uh, to answer your questions. So thanks so much, Dabrowski. So nice to connect with you today again. Thank you. Looking forward to seeing you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.